Commencing transmission. Engaging scramblers. Proxy chain initialized. And now, live from this hidden base of the Earth's core, the future ruler of Earth, Doomcock. <laughs> Greetings, vagabonds, rogues, villains, legionnaires, and future subjects. I am Dicta Van Doomcock, broadcasting from Xanadoom, my hidden base at the center of the Earth, and I'm joined today by my arch-nemesis and best friend, the extra-dimensional eldritch god himself, Harvey Cthulhu. Greetings, Doomcock. So... What are you going to destroy today? Are you going to rip into some Hollywood outrage with your traditional Doomcockian fury, tearing it a new one and making sure it has to wear Depends adult diapers from now on, metaphorically speaking? No, Harvey. No, today I come not to bury Caesar, but to praise him. Uh, who the hell is Caesar? It's just a metaphor, Harvey. A play on the words of the immortal bard himself. It means that I have not come to complain about an outrage, but to praise one of the few unspoiled bright spots left for fans of televised science fiction. The greatest sci-fi show on television right now, and perhaps one of the greatest of all time. Star Trek Discovery? You son of a bitch! Oh no! Don't throw me into the mushroom patch, Briar Doomcock! <laughs> Very clever, Harvey. But no, I will not be baited into freeing you by unleashing the terrible forces at my disposal in a fit of pique. Not today, anyway. Because today I am thinking only happy thoughts about the greatest sci-fi show on television, The Expanse. The Expanse? I thought that The Orville was your favorite. There are a number of outstanding science fiction shows on the air right now. The Orville, Black Mirror, Counterpart on Stars. But out of all these excellent productions, one shines through due to its richly realized universe, its deep storyline, its outstanding writing, and the excellence of its performances. The Expanse is clearly one of the best television shows on the air right now in any genre, and yet I never hear people talking about it. I wondered why given its obvious quality. But that question was answered for me the other day on Twitter. A friend of mine commented that she tried to watch The Expanse, but just couldn't get into it. There was no character she could latch onto, and so she gave up. That's when I realized what the problem was, and how Doomcock could help. The Expanse is a sprawling science fiction epic, and much like Game of Thrones, it's a show that can be difficult to get into because it's one extended story, and it's a very heavy lift to get through the first couple of episodes. You have to learn a great deal about the various political factions involved, which characters are aligned with which factions, their personal motivations, the physical realities of space travel. It's a lot to process. Well... Season 3 of The Expanse launches on April 11th on Sci-Fi, and I wanted to offer potential fans an on-ramp to the show, a video outlining everything you need to know to get through the first few episodes with minimal difficulty. Why? Because you people should be watching this. Doomcock's mission is to save pop culture, not merely by tearing down atrocities like Star Trek Discovery and Ghostbusters 2016, but also by promoting greatness. And have no doubt about it, The Expanse is great. I'm telling you it is worth the investment of concentration and time to get through the first two episodes, because once you do, you're going to be hooked, and you're going to binge the hell out of the first two seasons and then tune into sci-fi every Wednesday, ravenous, for more. Hmm. I thought STD was supposed to be Game of Thrones in space. <laughs> Rat bastard! Did you hear them? Did you see the crowds? We're not hitchhiking anymore. We're riding! That's a good question. Ah, hell. 
You're no fun anymore. Star Trek Discovery, a show for morons, written by morons, hooked on high fructose moron pills, claimed to be Game of Thrones in space. Why? Because they're fucking morons! They think being Game of Thrones in space means having torches on the bridge of the orc ship because they think fucking Mordor is in Westeros. They think having orcs eat people and Empress Slumming Tiger eat Ganglia makes them all cool and gory, and they think killing off a major character right away makes them all cutting edge. Well, dipshits, newsflash, Captain Slumming Tiger is no Eddard Stark. We didn't know her long enough to be shocked at her death or give a shit, and it takes more than violent death and gore to imitate Game of Thrones. You need a complex story that makes sense and not sonar in space. You need characters who don't make you want to throw up your own balls every time they appear. Mikey Spock is a proven emetic. You need to use colors in your show other than soul-crushing gray and yawn blue. And you need to recruit writers who write with a keyboard instead of their own poop. And yet, by those metrics, the Expanse really is what Star Trek Discovery lied about being Game of Thrones in space. First episode opens with an excellent text summary of the current situation. Mars is an independent military power. The inner planets depend on the resources of the asteroid belt. Belters live and work in space. In the belt, air and water are more precious than gold. For decades, tensions have been rising. Earth, Mars, and the belt are now on the brink of war. All it will take is a single spark. Now, that's a very brief description that goes by very quickly, so let's examine this situation more closely. This is what you need to know. Earth is the wealthiest planet in the solar system. It has the most powerful military, the greatest resources, and given that Mars began as an Earth colony, and the belt began essentially as an Earth economic enterprise, Earth is the dominant force in human affairs across the system. Or at least it has been up to this point the beginning of the series. Mars was established as an Earth colony beholden to and answerable to Earth for Earth's profit. But just as the colonies chafed under British rule, eventually declaring independence and forming the United States, with the passage of time the citizens of Mars have realized they have little in common with Earth and have declared themselves to be a sovereign world. This was inevitable. As Britain could not hold on to the New World colonies due to the logistical challenge of the colony's distance from the center of British military power and the inevitable cultural divide that would arise from the two groups living in vastly different environments with different challenges and values, so too was it inevitable that Mars would cast off the yoke of Earth's governance and cease to identify with her homeworld. Look at the differences. On Earth, the economy is moribund. There aren't enough jobs to go around, and so every citizen of Earth is guaranteed a basic subsistence level of living. Essentially, it's become a socialist state by necessity. On Mars, the situation is much different. Everyone must serve for a time in the Martian military. There is plenty of work to go around. Life is still a struggle, and the Martians are united in a singular goal. The terraforming of Mars turning the planet into a world where Martians can abandon their domes and live breathing free air beside a Martian ocean under a blue sky filled with clouds. Naturally, the rigorous pioneer people of Mars therefore look at Earth as decadent. Working hard and having military backgrounds, they see the citizens of Earth as soft, lazy freeloaders. They resent Earth's wealth and power, and they naturally harbor resentment for their origin as an Earth colony, and the fact that in the past, Earth used to bleed them dry financially. Indeed, Earth and Mars stood on the brink of war when Mars declared itself a sovereign planet. And although that war was narrowly averted, tensions have remained high in their interplanetary Cold War. As a result, Mars has aggressively built up its military, recruited the best scientists, and has developed some excellent military technology, including stealth ships, that make Earth wary. 
It is only Earth's vast numerical superiority, the number of nuclear missiles and vessels in its fleet, that keeps the more vigorous and innovative Mars in check. Mars hates Earth, but the Belt hates them both. The Belt is a broad general label applied to clans of workers who work the asteroid belt, providing vital resources to the inner planets. Many of these workers have lived their whole lives in space, working in zero gravity and living on space stations like Ceres Station, Tycho Station, Phoebe, and Eros. If the cultural and environmental differences between Earth and Mars irrevocably divided the citizens of those worlds, imagine how divided from the rest of humanity the Belters are. Growing up in zero gravity, their bones are fragile. They are often long and thin. A visit to Earth by a Martian is stressful and difficult due to the relative strength of Earth's gravity compared to that of Mars. A visit to Earth by a Belter, however, is torture. For them to survive without excruciating torment, belters on Earth need to be placed in tanks of water with an air supply to give them relief from Earth's crushing gravity. Although Mars is now basically liberated from Earth's direct control, the belters are the working class stiffs of the solar system, more akin to independent tribes of Arabs in the 19th century than any kind of organized nation. Groups of belters often fight among themselves as they mine asteroids to supply Earth and Mars with water and other vital resources. There is a semi-terrorist organization attempting to unite the belters into a potent political force, an organization known as the Outer Planets Alliance, the OPA, that is fighting for the independence of the Belt. Given that the OPA is viewed as a terrorist organization by Earth, its members are viewed with automatic suspicion and are often treated harshly. Belters work in severe and extremely hazardous conditions. They are essentially economic slaves. At one point in their history, they staged a strike, protesting for more humane working conditions. The strike was resolved when Earth decided to make an example of them, killing the entire group with a ruthless military strike, murdering every man, woman, and child. Belter resentment towards Earth and Mars is becoming radicalized, and it is probably only their internecine conflicts that prevent them from unifying as a separate nation-state and rising up against the exploitation of the inner planets. But if that ever happens, if the factions of Belters ever unite against the so-called inner planets, it will spark a military struggle of unimaginable proportions. This is the highly charged political situation at the beginning of the Expanse. In this manner, it most resembles Game of Thrones that we have three kingdoms vying for ultimate control of the solar system. And it is not really a spoiler to tell you that a fourth player is about to join the struggle and possibly a fifth power that none of them will see coming, a power that will completely change the game. Now, let's look briefly at the characters and situations you'll encounter in the first episode. Some very mild spoilers will ensue, nothing you won't learn by the end of the first episode, but this information will help you to ease your way into the first episode, and so I think it's worthwhile. The first character we encounter is a woman trapped inside a compartment on a spaceship. She is distraught and desperate. She breaks out of her makeshift prison and finds that the ship she's been on has been the scene of some violent incident. There is blood and a floating body. She dons a space suit with the name Julie on it and the name of a ship, the Scopuli. Remember these details. This is a pivotal and vital scene for everything that happens in the first season, and what she finds deeper in the ship will have ramifications for all of humanity. We next find ourselves on Ceres Station, the most important station in the Belt. It is a hub of trade where Earthers, Martians, and Belters intersect. Accordingly, tensions are high on this station. Belter resentment of harsh working conditions is growing, as Earth and Mars take the wealth of the asteroid belt, as Earth and Mars take the wealth of the asteroid belt and ration air and water for the very workers who supply them with that wealth. Here we meet one of my favorite characters, a hard-boiled belter detective named Joe Miller. 
employed by station security to keep the peace on Ceres, stop water theft, and do the bidding of his corporate masters. His boss assigns him the task of locating a missing heiress named Julie Mao. This is the woman we saw earlier, screaming on the ship. She is the daughter of Jules Pierre Mao, the incredibly wealthy owner of the Mao Kwiatkowski Mercantile, a corporation with countless subsidiaries. He is the wealthiest man in the known universe and virtually a governmental power unto himself, though he keeps a very low profile. Julie, a member of a student protest movement hostile to her father's business interests, took her raising skiff, the Razorback, and vanished. On Earth, we are introduced to a fantastic character, Christian Avasarala, the UN Deputy Undersecretary. Don't let the Deputy Undersecretary title fool you. She is one of the most influential and powerful figures in the Earth's government. We see her interrogating and torturing a belter caught smuggling contraband stealth technology for the OPA, the Belta Freedom Fighter Organization regarded as terrorists. Avasarala is a rich and complex character and is very representative of the kind of writing we see on The Expanse. Although we see her in an ugly light here, she is neither a villain nor a hero, or perhaps she's both. The Expanse is not afraid of moral ambiguity and tends to present richly drawn characters who, like most people, are a balance of darkness and light. As opposed to being a fucking plank of painted wood like the termite-infested Mikey Spock? Precisely. Furthermore, at this point, I'd like to say that The Expanse is, bar none, the most ethnically diverse show on television. There is a completely equal distribution of races and sexes among the lead characters, and it is perfectly done. This is how you properly present diversity on a show. Christian Avasarala is of, I think, Persian or Indian descent. One of my favorite characters, Naomi Nagata, is what the repulsive and buffoonish Mikey Spock pretends to be. A strong woman of color who, rather than being said to be brilliant, is shown to be brilliant. A belter. Many belters can be distinguished by the tattoos around their necks, designed to cover up the scars burned into them by the equipment they use while mining. Naomi Nagata becomes very important later on. But looking at the rest of the cast, we have Fred Johnson, the head of Tycho Station, despite being a native of Earth and the ex-military general blamed for the massacre of the striking belters. His chief of security, Jules Pierre Mao, Martian Marine Bobby Draper, the list goes on and on. This show casts the best actors for their roles without regard for their race. And you know what? It works. No one talks about their races or their sexes. It's not a political issue shoved in our faces. We are simply presented with memorable characters without any trumpeting or explanation. And this is a model of how to achieve diversity in casting successfully. Stop clubbing us over the head with politicizing how virtuous your casting is and just show us a great show. Race and sex are irrelevant here. The only thing that matters in the Expanse is your origin. Are you from Earth, Mars, or the Belt? There will always be divisions among humans because we're tribal by nature. But at least in the 23rd century, the lines of division have shifted from racial and sexual to planetary. And by showing us diverse actors without proclaiming how progressive and liberally virtuous they are, The Expanse is a role model in presenting people as people, not as demographics leading by example. Doomcock found this so refreshing, he didn't even notice how diverse this cast was until he thought about it in light of the atrocious Star Trek Discovery and the repulsive Ghostbusters 2016. Finally, in the first episode, we find ourselves aboard the Canterbury, a trawler transporting a vital load of mined ice to Ceres Station. While en route to Ceres, the Canterbury receives a distress signal that will change all their lives. Aboard the Canterbury, we meet several important characters, basically working-class stiffs, 
like the crew of the Nostromo in Alien, James Holden, a major character who grew up on Earth but works in the belt, Naomi Nagata, the Canterbury's chief engineer and a past member of the OPA, medic Shed Garvey, pilot Alex Kamal, and Amos Burton, a mechanic on the Canterbury. These people board a shuttlecraft to go check out the distress signal, and the rest is history. People, this is a rich tapestry against which a magnificent story unfolds. I have encapsulated it here in an overview that's fairly dry, but I assure you, this show is anything but dry. This show is like a combination of Game of Thrones and Firefly. It has the complexity and richness of Game of Thrones, but it also has the sparkling characters, the wit, and the joy of Firefly. I don't want to give any spoilers here, but I will tell you that a number of strangers from the first few episodes will be thrown together, uniting to form a ragtag crew that reminds me very much of Firefly and Dark Matter. Doomcock finds himself not only fascinated by these characters, but also quite concerned for their safety. Like Game of Thrones, The Expanse does not guarantee that anyone will survive. Based on a series of books by James S. A. Corey, this is one sprawling narrative, and not everyone is going to survive the ride. Some beloved characters are already lost, and this adds a supercharge of realism and tension to the series. The writing is sharp, the narrative moves briskly, the characters are well-defined and believable, the effects are well done, there is literally nothing here for Doomcock to criticize. What? You heard me. What, are you drunk? On Prozac? Did you get laid, Doomcock? No, no. And since there are no women down here other than a lizard woman and a brain in a jar at the Nazi base that has lipstick on it but I suspect is Hitler regardless of the high-pitched voice, no, Doomcock did not get laid. Hear me now and believe me always. The Expanse is the best sci-fi show on television right now, and possibly the best of all time. And if you are not watching this show, it's a crime. It's not enough to bitch about insulting garbage like Star Trek Discovery, people. That's not going to do the trick. If we want studios to respect us, to create new and better franchises instead of corrupting our beloved franchises with stunt casting and sex-changed characters, we need to support brilliant new work, and we need to support it strongly. The Expanse should be generating Game of Thrones-level buzz and ratings. Shame on us all, on all the geek community, if we fail to watch this show and spread the goddamn word. Trust Doomcock. Spin up to speed on this show and devour it. Spread the word. Force your friends and loved ones to watch it. It's a hurdle because you have to watch carefully and think to gain access to this compelling universe. But I know everyone that watches this channel is intellectually capable of it, and I know 95% of you will thank me if you watch. The Expanse is outstanding entertainment. As you know, Doomcock is a bottomless well of rage, and I hate everything I see. But I give The Expanse... Five stars, meaning I hate it as little as possible and view it with ire and grudging suspicion. Mm, it doesn't get better than that, kids. So, get access to The Expanse in any way you can. Both seasons are on Amazon Prime right now. And then watch the third season on Sci-Fi. Obey your overlord and believe in him, excellence. Awaits. Ha 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 